Hey folks, so I'm recording this presentation in case you missed the MSFC uh, September 9th meeting. Um, it's going to go over kind of the brief order of business that we did at the, the meeting and then go over the Pobuck float fishing presentation. Uh, so just some info on Midnight Sun Flycasters. The group was established in 1976 and has been a Fairbanks institution ever since. It's basically, the goals are to share knowledge, develop and refine skills, learn and promote, promote fly fishing and fish conservation in interior Alaska. And some of the group's biggest events are the annual kids camp, which you can see a picture of there in the top left, where uh, kids from 10 to 16 years of age and one of their guardians can go to a multi-day camp where they learn how to fly fish, um, all aspects of fly fishing, including fish identification, aquatic invertebrate identification, and different fly tying and fly fishing skills. Additionally, we have an annual banquet and usually held in March where we bring up a premier speaker to talk about some aspect of fly fishing or fish conservation. It's always a great event with food um, and, the, and the good speaker. Also, we have monthly meetings from September to March or April each year. And at each of these meetings, typically there's a short order of business and then a presentation of some sort about aspect of fishing, whether it be in Alaska or possibly other um, national or, or international fishing destinations. And if you haven't checked us out already, please check out our, our Facebook, our Twitter and website for more information, uh, the most update, up-to-date information. So for 2020 and 2021, our officers are myself, President Kevin Fraley, Vice President Will Samuel, um, and Secretary Oliver Ancans, and then Treasurer Dave Vick. I've been involved in the club on and off, going to meetings and that sort of thing since I arrived in Fairbanks in 2008, but um, I'm a fisheries ecologist and I really enjoy fishing for Chinook and she fish. Those are kind of my top fish that I like to fly fish for. And Will is a Fairbanks um, born and raised. He studies natural resource management and fisheries at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And then Oliver um, is a aspiring writer and uh, avid fly fisherman. Dave Vick has been involved in the club uh, for a long time. So uh, a couple announcements coming up in October. We'll have a virtual presentation by Oliver looking at fly fishing for lake trout in Alaska. And I'm pretty excited for this one because I've always struggled to catch lake trout on the fly. And Oliver um, clearly is quite good at it. So I'm looking forward to getting picking up some tips and hearing his presentation on that. Uh, the exact date and time will be announced on Facebook and social media later once we figure that out. Also, we're thinking about doing a Delta Clearwater coho fishing meetup or barbecue in early October. Depending on how things are looking with COVID, um, we might do this and it would be at the boat launch on the Delta Clearwater River. It's nice because there's area there at the park to kind of spread out you can bring some girls to have a barbecue and do some fishing for coho assuming the coho season is open this year which last year it was closed early so we'll see what that uh, what happens with that but certainly check our facebook page for updates on that. also will and oliver are organizing a possible monthly fly tying night if you are interested in this please contact us um, we want to you know see how many people would like to do this. I'm sure there's plenty of people in Fairbanks that enjoy fly tying and would, would want to get together with other like-minded folks, maybe once a month at a restaurant or at um, possibly Big Ray's uh, fly shop and do some fly tying together. And chatting. Also, our banquet is tentatively scheduled sometime in March 2021. This is usually um, during a Saturday night, and we're thinking about approaching Nancy Morris, who's a fly fishing guide on the Connect Talk River. She was slated for last year, but our banquet was canceled due to the COVID situation. So hopefully we can get her back this year. Uh, she's done a presentation for the club before, and I think she'll be really good. Also, the kids camp is June 11th through 13th, 2021 at Lost Lake. You can find applications for that and more information on our website. So um, getting into the, the presentations, I'm really excited to talk about this Kobuk River float fishing, um, and it's kind of based on a trip I did last fall, um, kind of a bucket list trip where I floated from the upper Kobuk down to the village of, of Kobuk, uh, from Walker Lake to the village of Kobuk. So I'll kind of go through a bunch of different things here. Um, I'll talk about why 
I was focusing on the Kobuk, what's so special about it. I'll talk a little bit about the river itself, the, the features of it, and then also the chi fish or the canoe, which are the kind of the featured fish, harpen of the north that uh, inhabit the Kobuk, that are the, why everybody goes after the fish. I'll talk uh, briefly about the planning and logistics for fishing the Kobuk. I'll go over some recommended gear kind of at a broad level and also get into some recommended fishing gear and tactics and then go through a trip narrative and slideshow of a trip from last year. So if you're not familiar with the Kobuk River, it's outlined in blue here. This is the entire drainage of the Kobuk. And you can see Fairbanks down on the bottom right there. Uh, the little towns of Coldfoot and Edels. Then you can see Kobuk Village, Ambler, and Kiana as you go down the Kobuk River. Kotzebue, out on the, the west coast there near Kotzebue Sound. So the Kobuk River headwater, head, you know, headwaters in Gates of the Arctic National Park, as you can see outlined in orange there, um, near Walker Lake, and then it flows through the Gates of the Arctic National Preserve. The Paw River is kind of one of the bigger tributaries that joins it. Flows past some of those villages through Kobuk Valley National Park and along No Attack National Preserve, and then into Hotham Inlet near Kotzebue. And then out, that goes out into Kotzebue Sound. For my float trip, I focused on this area of the river in the red here that comes out of the, the Brooks Range, basically, the upper river um, from Walker Lake to Kobuk Village. And zoom so zooming in on the area that I floated, you can see Walker Lake in the upper right there, um, the outlet rapids of Walker Lake. The river goes through a couple different canyons. There's a lot of different uh, tributaries that come in that are kind of fed by large lakes. And then on the Far left side there is Kobuk Village, and that's the extent of where I floated. But a little bit about the river. So it's a national wild and scenic river, and it's designated that way because it's free flowing. That means it's not dammed, it's not crossed by bridges, this sort of thing. Um, it's got a scenic quality, it's wild, it's you know worth preserving, basically, is why it was designated as such. And uh, the river flows from the Brooks Range. It's kind of unique because it flows from the Brooks Range. Um, over into western Alaska. So it and the Noatak are kind of the only rivers that, that follow that path. So it's a very unique system. And so a little bit about the target species on the Kobuk that everybody wants to catch. Um, so the shefish or the Inkanu are the largest whitefish species. They're much bigger than the broad whitefish, the humpback whitefish, all those other um, smaller whitefish. And they eat different things too. They're, these shefish are predatory. They like to eat other fish or or larger invertebrates, whereas other species of whitefish typically eat very tiny, small, benthic invertebrates. Um, these fish can live for more than 30 years, especially in the, the higher Arctic rivers like the Kobuk, because they grow slowly and have a lot of time to mature, and they can get up to 60 pounds. The IGFA world record is 53 pounds, but there's been others that unverified it's thought that they can get up to 60. And the all tackle world record and nine of 16 line class records for IGFA are from the Kobuk River or, or its tributaries. So, I mean, arguably it's the, the world's foremost uh, she fish fishery because of that alone. Uh, it's just a lot of a lot of fish and a lot of large fish in this river. And there's anadromous and freshwater populations of she fish. In the Kobuk and Selavik drainage, the, the fish are more anadromous. So they go out to sea just like salmon, except they don't range as far out to sea. They kind of stay near the coast. In the Hotham Inlet or different lagoons or Kotzebue Sound, and they eat out there, they get big, they spend the winter and they go up river to spawn. In the Yukon and Kuskokwim drainage, the fish typically mostly spend their whole life in fresh water, but there's exceptions to that, I believe. And, um, you know, you can even find she fish in the Tanana and Tina rivers, like that fish on the right. There is a fish from the Tina, but they're hard to find. They're only around seasonally, and it's not reliable uh, to find them, unlike the Kobuk. So that's why. Great to go to the Kobuk because you know you're going to find large numbers of these fish. It's the best place in the world to go. They're found uh, in Alaska, Russia, and Northwest Canada, so a pretty unique distribution for these fish. So, getting into some of the planning and logistics for the Kobuk, um, there's kind of four different gateways that you can access the river from, and I won't get into too much detail because you can really go down a rabbit hole here and get into the weeds, but um, one of the most, most popular ones that we chose was, so was to go to Bettles. So you can either fly to Bettles from Fairbanks on a scheduled flight, or you can drive up the Dalton Highway and get picked up along the road by plane and flown to Bettles and then out, out to the Cobra. Good parts of this are that 
flights are usually available. Um, we booked ours about six months in advance, and we were a little worried that we might not get the dates that we wanted, but luckily we were able to do this flight service. That was good. Um, there's good access to the upper river from Bettles, the lakes and stuff, and via float plane. Downsides to Bettles are it is pretty expensive, but everything is when you try to get to the Kobuk, and it can be complicated logistically, especially if you're driving the Halt Road. You can get up there, and then you take one flight to Bettles, another flight out to Walker Lake, and then, of course, the opposite of that when you come back. Um, if you're doing a scheduled flight from Fairbanks to Bettles, the excess baggage fees could be a problem if you're bringing a large raft or if you're potentially bringing meat back hunting. If you try to go through Coldfoot, that's another viable option. Drive the Hall Road to Coldfoot and get dropped off um, in the Upper River via plane and picked up from there. Nice because it's pretty simple logistically. There's only basically one leg of flying and you have good access to the Upper River. I prefer, you know, I was more interested in because it's more scenic. It comes out of the Brooks Range, um, goes through the, the National Park and Preserve, and there's more whitewater there, which I enjoy. The downsides of Coldfoot is the flight service there is usually booked up over a year in advance because people, everybody wants to travel in August and September when the she fish are in their spawning beds, moving up to their spawning areas. And, you know, everybody's hunting or hiking at this time of year. And this flight service out of Coldfoot is oftentimes booked up incredibly far in advance. So you definitely want to get in early and book your dates if you're going to go through them. Uh, another option is Western Alaska. Some people do this. They fly from Fairbanks to Anchorage and then Kotzebue and then on Alaska Airlines and then take a smaller flight out to some of the villages on the Kobuk. The pros for this is it might be cheaper with those scheduled flights. You get good access to the lower Kobuk, which can be good fishing and hunting. But, you know, like I mentioned, less of the scenic um, and wild quality. The potential downsides are that you have to go all the way through Anchorage to get out there. And oftentimes you want to arrange for river transportation. If you're not floating, uh, there's no access really to the upper lakes. Hard to find flight service that would take you up to Walker Lake, for example. And then if you're flying through airlines, you're going to have to get charged for excess baggage for your raft and any meat that you bring back. There's also an option to go straight out of Fairbanks. There's a couple of flight services that will land large bush planes on gravel bars in the Kobuk, the mid Kobuk. Um, the pros for that is it's really simple logistically. It's great for larger parties because these planes are typically, typically pretty big. Um, and if you're interested only in fishing, that's a good option. If you wanted to see the upper river more of that, you would probably wouldn't want to do this. The cons are that it's more expensive because they're, they're larger planes. And you miss out on the or maybe the more scenic and challenging river section. I would stress with any of this, you know, try to book like six months to a year in advance, especially if you want to go through Coldfoot. You're going to have to book real, real early to make sure you get the dates that you want. A little more on planning and logistics, you're going to want to consider your weight limit and the plane types that the flight service might have and figure out which one is most economical for you. Um, if you're taking a scheduled flight, you want to see what the amount of baggage you're allowed and then how much it costs for excess baggage, which you most definitely have to uh, utilize. Um, if you're, you, it's possible to take something as small as a Super Cub, which would be cheaper, but there's not a lot of room in a Super Cub, probably suitable for one person and very minimal gear. So if you wanted to say pack raft up or Koba, you might be able to get away with a, uh, taking a cub um, out there. And if you weren't doing any hunting, but just floating and fishing. You could do that. The next biggest option would be one of the Cessna models, which is usually suitable for one to three people and a good amount of gear. And then you can also go with a beaver, which are bigger, but they hold a lot more gear and people. They're a pretty cool plane too. They're not really made anymore. They're kind of a throwback and it's always fun to, to fly in those things, but they're pretty expensive because of the amount of fuel and the size of them. You can also go with bigger planes like otters or cheap. That one in the bottom right is an otter and those get really expensive, but you can take a whole party out there if you'd like to, or, you know, uh, an incredible amount of gear if you've got the money and the, and the, the will to do so. You also want to think about um, whether you're going to have to land and take off on wheels or floats. Wheel planes generally have higher weight limits um, than float planes because float planes are carrying that extra weight and uh, it's a little harder for them to take off when they're not on a hard, nice hard rolling surface. And if anybody has any more specific questions about this stuff, definitely um, message me, send me a message because I've obviously thought a lot about this when I was planning my trip and I'd be happy to share info on specifics, but I won't go into too much detail because I know it might bore some people that aren't necessarily interested in all the planning and are more interested in seeing some photos of the scenery and the fishing, which we'll get to soon, hopefully. A little more about the planning and logistics. So there's a number of places you can put in or take out. Walker Lake is kind of the uppermost place you can put in. There's 
some flight services that will land wheeled planes on upper gravel bars. Um, you'd have to check with them. You can uh, go into Notavukti Lake, which bypasses the Walker Lake Outlet Rapids. If you're not comfortable doing class three or four whitewater, that's a good option. You can also go into Lake Mikakosa, which bypasses basically all the whitewater in the upper Kova. Or you can they can get you can get your flight service to drop you off on the river itself on a gravel bar or in the river with a float plane below the lower canyon of Koba, which is the best hunting and chief fish stretch. But if you if you want to check out more of the scenic river, you're gonna miss out on all that. You could also go to the Pa River Confluence, which is basically the chief fish hotspot. There's large aggregations of them there. And you can even do that without floating. You could get a float plane ride to the Pa River Confluence, stay there a few days fishing, and then get picked up at the same place. It's also a good place to take out or even put in if you'd want to. Um, Kobuk is the upstream most village, and it's got an airstrip, so that's a good place to take or put in if you want to float the lower river. Once you get um, to the Paw River, though, you start running into jet boats and a lot more people. It gets less wild, although the fishing is still pretty good. Those are all considerations. There's uh, And then there's a series of villages lower down, Ambler, uh, Shangnak, Kiana, that you could potentially float to or from. I would recommend calculating river mileages, your total mileage, on Google Earth using the draw tool and plan out kind of your average ideal daily float length and then kind of prioritize different locations that you want to hit, like river confluences or good fishing areas, and try to put out a plan of, you know, how many days you're going to do it in and how much you're going to float each day. And best if you give yourself a day or two of kind of wiggle room in case you run into something interesting as you're floating and you want to spend more time in a certain area for fishing, hunting, or whatever it might be. That's always smart so that you're not kind of a slave to your itinerary and having to pass up good sections. Always leave a plan with someone who can contact authorities if something goes awry or if you lose communications. Let the flight service know what your plan was and then that sort of thing because the flight service might not have your most detailed plans. They just know when they're dropping you off and when they're picking you up, they might not really know what you're doing in between. So good to have somebody that has a really good idea where you're going, what you're doing. Some just selected gear recommendations for what I consider the most important things for a float of the Kobuk. Your boat, you need to have a boat large enough for the number of people and the amount of gear you're, you need. Um, and you know, if you want specific recommendations on different boats, certainly hit me up. There's so many different permutations of what you can do, different brands, different and, and um, specifications of boats. So. You just want to kind of do some research on like the Alaska Outdoor Forums is a great place to look up certain boats and models for the amount of people and the amount of gear you want. If you have your boat, um, you want to do a test float with it, with all your gear and all your passengers before you do the actual trip. So do a day trip on the China or an overnight trip with all your gear and everything. So you have it handles. Are you going to be able to do a white water with it? Do you need to jettison some stuff? That's a great way to kind of figure out uh, what you're going to do because you don't want to end up out there in the middle of nowhere and have to start you know, throwing away gear in, into the wilderness because you don't have enough room. And then consider, you know, extra room if you're going to be hunting or if you want to bring home some some fish. There's also um, there's also opportunities for renting boats in Fairbanks, and that, that's a possibility too. Some of the flight services even rent boats. So look into that if you don't want to spend the cash to, to get a boat yourself. Um, for communications, those are pretty much vital to contact flight services and check in or call for help. I'd say the sat phone is pretty much needed on the Kobuk, depending on where you're going in, but flight services might not be able to check email or texts for um, your in-reach messages. So with sat phone, you can call them on their landline and that sort of thing. It's more reliable, um, but you can do the in-reach if your flight service is okay with it and they can receive messages or emails. When we went in through Bettles, they don't have cell service there. So I wasn't really com uh, comfortable just sending them an email, or change of plans or that sort of thing. So we went with a sat phone rental, which was actually pretty reasonable. We rented a phone from somewhere here in Fairbanks. Make sure you write down and bring your contact numbers and emails. So many people store those on their phone and they don't have them memorized. So make sure you do that because you might get out there and maybe you forgot your phone or you ran out of battery on your phone. And you don't know any anybody's numbers and you're kind of stuck. So that's a good thing to do too. For navigation, print out some maps and definitely bring a GPS. Pre-program in points of interest. Point, Put the points on Google Earth and then program into your GPS or like river confluences or fishing spots, that sort of thing that you know well in advance that you have that coming up and you can plan your stops and that sort of thing. Um, and then you can laminate your maps or put them in good plastic. Keep them dry. 
I think that's the, probably another one of the top important things. Um, cause oftentimes if you're going during G fish season, August, September, the weather's not going to be great. It'll be raining the whole time. So what I've done recently is gone with a dry suit. You're basically bomb proof with that. You never have to worry about getting cold or wet, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, but you know, most people use waders or it's a really good rain suit. But that's definitely vital gear. Cause you don't want to be shivering and having a bad time while you're out there. You want to be warm and confident and ready to hunt or fish, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Recommended fly fishing gear and tactics. So I would recommend a, a seven to 10 weight fly rod and you can go with a single hand or a spay. Um, the spay would be nice. If you see in that picture there, the river is pretty, pretty broad and you could get way out there further with the spay and use it some deeper water with some, maybe some bigger fish. Um, but single hand was what I used and that worked okay for me. And for the fly line, I would use a fast sink tip or full sink line to get down there because the fish are either kind of staging to spawn or they're in a spawning aggregation. They're kind of down near the bottom of the river. So you want to get down deep to them. I would use 20 plus pound monofilament leaders. Um, just because the fish are not leader shy and the heavier, you, heavier you go, the better, especially if you're catching and releasing fish, bring them in quicker without exhausting them, with heavier line and let them go. And you hopefully have less uh, mortality because they're out there spawning. So you don't want to be removing their, their genes from the population for flies. Uh, I would say use medium to large streamers, white color is best. I really like the rabbit strip or clouser style. Flies, um, white and red, white and blue worked well. Something light colored because the water's kind of tannic and those show up really well. And as long as the fish can see it, they're going to go for it. They're very aggressive. I was struggling with, um, I started with Dalai Lamas that had kind of octopus hooks with an articulation and I would get hits, but I just couldn't get the hook to sink long enough to, to bring in the fish. So I went to these pike flies that have much wider hook gaps and that really did a much better job of holding the fish and upped my percentage of bringing them in my recommendation there. I'd say swing flies through the deeper runs and pools. The deeper you can get, the better. And then you can either dead drift or strip the fly. Either way will work. And you can add a little bit of split shot if you need to get down a little deeper. What we found really effective was to prospect for chief fish by throwing a large spoon with a spin rod while floating along. If you're floating the upper section, you, there's quite a bit of, you know, multiple days potentially where all you have is grayling and chums and you don't really know when you're going to run into the first chief fish down the river. So um, you can cover much more water and just keep on floating and not spend time stopping by just throwing these large spoons. And it was pretty effective in finding the, the she fish doing that. The fish aren't timid or leader shy. If you can find them and the river's not blown out, you know, if the river is decently clear and they can see the fly, you're going to, you're going to get bites. Fine. Once you find them. So, okay. Getting into the fun part, the trip narrative. Um, so we went in, it was about September 6th last year in 2019. And we flew in um, to Bettles from the Hall Road. You can see all our gear lined up there along the Prospect Airstrip. I'd recommend trying to put stuff into large duffels as possible so that it's easy to load. You're not dealing with a bunch of small pieces that you might be getting. Um, the pilots are usually on a pretty tight schedule, so they like to be efficient. So we got everything ready and weighed. We had a small little luggage scale that we used to make sure our weights were good and all kind of consolidated. It really helps them. I'll, I'll thank you for it. There's a picture of John, buddy John there who came along on the trip on the, in the top left photo with everything packed into a Cessna on wheels that took us from the Hall Road to Petals. Then in the photo below that is above the Koyakuk River as we're coming into Petals, a little village along the river there. And then that top right photo is the Brooks Range Aviation headquarters and the fuel depot in Petals. Then we were driven in an old crappy vehicle down the road to the Petals float pond. Where we got into the beaver that would take us to Walker Lake. There's the beaver that took us out there. Really cool old plane. I, I love these things. They're just, they sound awesome. They got that big radial engine. Um, nice view, you know, a lot of glass to, to look out at and, and, and see the, the countryside. It's always a, a treat to fly in them. And you can see in this photo that uh, the weather was pretty good for us at the start here in Petals. As we headed into Walker Lake, it got started to deteriorate. We were getting water and fog and the plane was having to go lower and lower, but this is our first glimpse of Walker Lake looking up Lake on that left photo and then coming into land near the outlet on the right photo. There's our pilot getting ready to take off all our gear on the beach. And that's a pretty sobering moment when the plane fires up and takes off and all of a sudden everything's quiet. If anybody's done a fly out trip um, out in remote Alaska before, you definitely 
yeah, you know, it's a sobering moment for sure. Cause you realize I'm out here under my own devices and, uh, oh, it's, this is it. We're out here. So the fun starts then. We found a nice campsite right at this outlet, uh, near that lake outlet on the beach, you know, the typical place where they, they drop you Had a moose wander through the camp there. And while we're here in this spot, we were in Gates of the Arctic National Park. Once you start floating up the outlet, you get out of the park and it preserved pretty quickly. So we did a little uh, hanging out by the campfire, had some dinner, got the boat blown up, and gear kind of ready to go. Went out and did a little fishing. And it wasn't great fishing. We were hoping to find some lake trout, but uh, we didn't find them. Maybe because they were more interested in spawning that time in September rather than, than biting. But we did find just a couple of nice large grayling that, that bit some creamers for the evening. So that was a good start to the trip. So uh, the next few slides, I'll start going through the upper section of the float. Um, so these last few pictures were from Walker Lake, which is on the top right there, where that red star is. And then we floated down through the outlet rapids and the canyons to the the uh, star lower down. So I'll kind of go through the pictures and the narrative for this section of the river. So here's the, the second morning floating towards the outlet. And then to the, the picture on the right is the actual outlet of Walker Lake. And um, the fishing wasn't great in the lake, but right here in the outlet, we found bunch of big groups of grayling, which was, they were really eager to hit. So that was fun to catch a bunch. We spent 20 to 30 minutes there, but we were kind of distracted because we knew that just three quarters of a mile down the outlet is these, the biggest rapids of the trip. Um, and it's pretty high stakes because you've got a 120 mile, you know, seven day trip and you know, rapids right at the beginning. If something goes wrong, you might've totally screwed up your whole trip. So we were, you know, we were debating with each other about whether to, to portage or to run them. Um, but we got down to the start of the rapids and it kind of starts pretty quick. There's not a lot of opportunity to pull over and look at them. We got a quick look and it was more laziness than anything. We just didn't want to portage all our gear. We had just blown up the boat and put everything in it. So we decided to go ahead and run the rapids. They were, the flows were looking pretty good for it. And both John and I are good rivermen that are pretty experienced with the white water. So. We decided to run it and we didn't get any pictures of the rapids because obviously we were preoccupied but i did find um, a picture a screenshot from some video of somebody else running the rapids next here i'll show you so this is what they look like and they're the class three or four rapids in this photo here you can you don't see a lot of rocks exposed so this is kind of higher water levels which is good for these people um because you can kind of just glide over a lot of it but the flows that we had, there was a lot more bedrock and boulders exposed, so we needed to do a lot more maneuvering. So ours, our experience was more on the class four end. But luckily, I had gone up front with a canoe paddle, and I was on the oars, and we were able to really well navigate through there. But we chipped a lot of water, and we kind of got out at the, the bottom of the rapids. We had to pump out, you know, a foot of water out of the boat. Um, but it was definitely a sobering or a harrowing experience because you've got all this gear. The raft's heavy; it's hard to maneuver. You've got Six days ahead of you where you don't want to you know ruin your whole float by having something go wrong you know you know let's say you irreparably pop your boat or something you're kind of screwed you'd have to hike everything back up to the lake and you'd be done so without a she fish so, so um you know we were with high stakes we were serious at this point but we got through it and after that it was quite nice floating till you hit the, the main kobuk river just a couple miles down river then we had a, a couple days of just really nice floating through this upper section. There wasn't a lot of wildlife. There was a lot of grayling, and there was not really any salmon yet. They're supposedly up there, but we didn't see any. We stopped at different confluences to fish. They were, it was pretty good for grayling. Kind of got our fill of grayling, really, in the first day. Didn't see much wildlife yet, but it was pretty scenery and, and nice floating. Some pictures of fishing out of the boat and a, a campsite on a nice gravel bar on that upper river. Then we got into the canyon section. Um, so there's the upper canyon rapids. I put in quotation marks because they're not really a rapid <laughs> at the flows we saw. Maybe they are at some other flows, but basically you just wander around a few boulders. It's nice. It's a bedrock canyon, but there's nothing challenging about it. After reading about it online, we were worried, but um, really there was nothing to worry about there. Then we hit the lower canyon rapids on the right hand picture of that. That's looking upstream from below the rapids. And that was more challenging. That was class two or three. It, it starts out pretty nice. Um, so you, if you see that rock face on the, the right-hand side, well, the river bends sharply to the right um, behind that. So 
basically if you're coming down river you're going you're just gliding along and then all of a sudden you have this almost 90 degree left turn and then you have this bedrock rapid which comes upon you really suddenly and there's definitely opportunity to for people to get hurt or to ruin your boat on that so that was challenging but john was on the oars with that and did a great job and pretty much as soon as we got through that we started seeing thumb salmon carcasses so we we're into the kind of what i consider the middle section of this float where there's a lot more wildlife because of the you know predators being drawn by those salmon and, and the nutrients in the ecosystem so getting into the the middle section below the lower canyon down to the paw river and you can see there's kind of these series of large lakes that um, where there are tributaries that flow into the the Kobuk River, and the river slows down a little bit, not as much white water. Basically, the white water is done after the lower canyon. Um, so we'll go through that now. Yeah, so we started finding chum salmon, which was kind of a fun um, diversion from grayling. They were pretty eager to hit, and they were kind of hanging out near confluences of tributaries, aging to spawn to go up those. And we started seeing wolf and bear sign. The the grassy banks along the river were matted down as you know from bear highways. And one day we were floating around, came around a bend and walking upstream on one of those highways. There's a bear just 50 yards away, beautiful blonde grizz. And we got real close to him, got a great view, and he jetted off into the trees. And it was good because even though these these bears, you know, potentially don't see a lot of humans, because nobody really comes upstream above the Paw River very far, and nobody can make it up past the lower canyon with a jet boat. Um, you, you don't, you would think they'd be pretty curious and maybe not too human averse, but pretty much every bear we saw just took off. It didn't bother us. So that was great. One night we heard some wolves howling, uh, which was pretty cool. Very wild out there. There's a picture on the left. Uh, I think that's a golden eagle and a raven of a, an aggregation of spawning chums and a nice campsite on the right there. Um, yeah, you know, there's some other fun times with bears. I was hanging out at camp, one just like that one on the right in the evening, sitting around the fire and all of a sudden a bear charges out of the trees about 100 yards upstream, zooms out, grabs the salmon with a like surgical strike and then runs back into the trees. And he was gone before I could even get gone out of the tent. So that's pretty cool. And she fish day. We finally found the she fish. I think it was downstream of Acapella Creek a little bit. So we were prospecting. Uh, it was kind of rainy, crappy weather. And John was throwing with throwing the spoon, prospecting, and you can see on that left picture there is kind of a nondescript bend, just deep, kind of a deep run, and all of a sudden he gets a he got a strike, and we could tell right away it wasn't a, a grayling or chums because of the the fight. You know these fish are they're known for their fighting prowess. They'll leap, they'll make runs, and they're really strong. So we were pretty stoked. You know we pulled over, and he he brought that ashore, and we danced a jig on the beach, and started fishing in earnest and it was almost every cast at first we were hooking fish so there was obviously a big aggregation right off the bat there and, and like i mentioned i was struggling with the smaller flies but once i switched to a larger fly i started catching up nothing real big in this first uh part like five to seven pound fish but beautiful fish and i was just so stoked to catch the first sheep which i've been wanting to catch for so long it's so great to finally get one after we you know, found this spot Pretty much any big pool or run after that section downstream all the way till the selby river confluence held fish and we could fish out of the raft or pull over if we found a really um, good concentration of fish there's some more pictures there john catching one out of the boat uh, kind of got lazy after a while and stopped pulling over and just started fishing from the boat you could the river was clear enough uh, at points you could see you could look down into pools and see the, the fish in there so you could know where they were and getting down further, this is the one on the left here is below, I think, the Selby River confluence. We kept some fish for dinner, and they're so big, you, you know, between two guys, we didn't keep, I think we kept maybe two, and that was almost too much fish to eat one night, but they tasted amazing, you know, being out there in the backcountry, cooked with some oil and whatnot. It was just really good. Um, we tried to, you know, keep, keep everything away from our tent site and stuff, bear safety, but that night, about uh, midnight, we heard, I woke up, I didn't know why I woke up, but I heard splashing, rhythmic splashing in the river next to the tent. And I bolted out of the, the tent and lit up my headlamp. And there was a bear just, you know, 20, 30 yards away, right in the river, staring at me back. And so I yelled for John. He came out and held the rifle on it. But it just kind of sauntered up river and left us alone. But we didn't sleep very well after that. That night, every little splash from fish, that sort of thing, we thought the bear's back. But he never did come back. So that was good. And yeah, then there was a fair bit of floating down to the Paw River confluence. And that's a picture on the right there of 
So we kind of went river left as far as possible and hit the upper paw confluence. And there wasn't a lot of fish there, surprisingly. We thought there'd be a lot there, but it was a nice campsite, as you can see, and the weather was starting to improve. And here we started seeing evidence of humans. There was like birch uh, tree peelings from um, Alaska natives, you know, using the tree, the trees for that, and, and some evidence of moose camps and sort of thing, few foot, human footprints. So starting to get into human land. The next day we floated down to the lower Paw River confluence. And that's where we found the she-fish motherlode. So here's a, one of our bigger fish we caught down at there. And, and if you look behind Dawn there, that's the Paw River coming in. And then off frame to the left is where the main Cobut comes in. And it's kind of this nice big choppy run. And basically every cast here, I mean, there must've been hundreds of fish in this aggregation. And almost every cast you, you'd hook a fish. So after a couple hours of fishing, we had had our fill, you know, our arms were tired and we caught a few big ones, but you have to weed through a fair number of, you know, the five to seven pound ones to get large one like Don has there where it's approaching 15, 20 pounds. Never got anything much bigger than that, but it was really exciting and fun. And, you know, we, we spent a lot of time there at that confluence. The picture is some fly fishing action. This drift on the left, every single time I drifted through, I just had the perfect drift there. And every single time I would get a hit, a fish on, and, you know, as many fish as I wanted. So it was, it was pretty great, but we had, you know, our, our itinerary to follow. So we continued on after a while my reluctance. Now getting into the lower section, below the Paw River to the Kobuk Village. And this is just kind of arbitrary sectioning based on what I was thinking for my float, but it's really not even considered the lower river until you get down into you know those lower villages. But this section, things slow down a lot more. Um, the fishing kind of petered off. There's fewer, fewer she fish. I think they're, you know, concentrated up higher. And then a lot more jet boat traffic, fish camps and folks that we ran into. That's some nice mountains off in the distance you could see. There's a, one of the first fish camps we saw on the right there. That one was abandoned, but we started seeing folks at their fish camp with their nets set out and hanging out. Everybody was really friendly. They waved, and shouted out, said hi. Here's some more photos on the lower river. Nice northern lights display one night. There's a, a she fish. I actually took the those white things. Are ear, the she fish ear bones are otoliths. And you can actually age a fish with those. It's a tree ring. Uh, rings on a tree you can tell how old they are uh, but they're, they're people even take them out for jewelry sometimes but if you know how to get them out they're kind of a cool thing to check out and the fish has a different shaped otolith uh, that was another nice fish evening meal there and we got into some pike too which was kind of fun to get a little bit more fish diversity and kind of some of these backwater sloughs there was a few pike in there we never found a, a lot of them, but we were still pretty high up in the river. So I'm sure if you floated the lower section, there's there'd be some really good pike fishing, you know, down below Kobuk, for example. And finally, after kind of a lot of long, windy, wide, windy sections of the river, we got down to Kobuk Village, which you can see there on the left. Nice little small village. That fellow on the right there is checking his set nets, and he was kind enough to uh, see us coming. He zoomed over and got his ATV and trailer and we paid him a little bit to take us over to through the village, about a half mile to the airstrip where we get picked up by our float service. We called the float service and we had, they weren't going to pick us up until the next day. So basically we had uh, the evening to look around and in, in town and check out all the, the fish on drying racks and the boats and talk to some villagers, which was really fun. Uh, for me as a fisheries biologist, it was really cool to see all the different species that were on the drying rack. So there were chi fish, there was, um, salmon, and then there was some other species like smaller whitefish species, even pike, and one lone sockeye. I don't know where that sockeye was going because I don't think there's a sockeye spawning population in the Kobuk, but it was neat to see them. More photos of the town. Nice little church there, kind of a, a quaint little little place, pretty sleepy. There's the community center on the left, and then the airport on the right. And we were just allowed to camp near the airport. There's a little spot there where folks can post up if they're taking out or putting in. Um, we had all our stuff out there, kind of a yard sale, but we were you know, working on weighing it all again and consolidating it to facilitate um, things for the air service. And a lot of folks, I guess, you know, word got through the grapevine. There were some people from out of town there. So a lot of people stopped by and chatted with us about where we floated through, the she fish, you know, kind of how things were in the past, hunting. Even the Ambler Road, it was interesting to hear people's opinions on that, which would be going in. Uh, if you look on the right-hand side there, those mountains back behind those kids, uh, those, that's where you know several of the, the mines would be that this road would be accessing. 
the kids were the local kids were having a blast zooming around on their four wheelers and showing off. So we were the entertainment for the day for them. So some closing thoughts on this trip. Um, the Kobuk is one of the wildest places in Alaska with very little evidence of other humans until you reach that Paw River. So it's pretty special. It's one of the favorite trips I've done in Alaska. And you know, I've done quite a bit of remote um, travel. So to me, it was really deeply special, wild, once in a lifetime experience to float it, especially because of the wilderness character, just the quiet, how far out there you are um, and the solitude. It's really wonderful. And the chief fish numbers, the size of the fish, and the population health and abundance are incredible. And, of course, need to be protected, and, and managers have done a good job of it so far. But, you know, who, who knows what's going to happen in the future? There's a reason why these fish grow so big and are so abundant in there. That's because there's really very few threats as far as human development and overfishing and that sort of thing. Um, I'd say the fly fishing opportunities are obviously world-class for chief fish, probably the best place in the world to go for chief fish. And the grayling fishing was great too. If I, you know, wanted to spend more time there, I'm sure you could get some really large grayling. So I'd be kind of remiss without mentioning a couple of the conservation threats in the area. Kind of taking off my midnight sun flycaster hat and putting on my fisheries ecology hat. But um, in the past few years, there's been some fish found uh, die-offs in Kobuk River, and it's assumed because of high water temperatures and disease and fungus. And so hopefully this won't be more of a widespread thing is, you know, potentially climate change causes warming water temperatures and invasions of, of different parasites and different species, but certainly something to think about because we want to protect these amazing wild areas like this. And so being aware of these issues is really important. And, you know, I'm bringing these up because I love this, this area after floating through it and I want to inspire others to value it like I do and you know, any threat, anything that would threaten it, I'm totally against. So. I would, and then on the right there is the just a map of the proposed Ambler Road, which uh, the BLM has greenlit um, through their record of decision, basically the right of way to, for this road to go through. There's still a lot of, um, I guess, hurdles that the mining companies would need to go through to actually put this road in. But uh, this is really concerning because this road would cross the Alatna, the John, the Koyukuk, and the Kobuk Wild and Scenic Rivers potentially exposing them to catastrophic oil spills. Let's say a fuel tanker went off a bridge on one of these these rivers. You know, that could be devastating for chief fish and the Kobuk or even the Alatna River, which is, has one of the largest uh, spawning chief fish populations in the Koyukuk. So it just seems like a, a poor idea to me. Um, and, you know, I won't go into this in too much detail, but if anybody has questions about this or wants more information, please hit me up because this is these are things that we need to worry about. You know, it's one thing to really enjoy the outdoors, but we need to protect these places to make sure that they're there for our children and, and they aren't degraded. Just one more plug here. So um, basically, you know, all the local comments and all the emails that were sent in commenting on the Ambler Road were, you know, for the majority opposed to this place. So when the BLM greenlit this project, they pretty much just disregarded public opinion and even that of some people that, arguably are the most affected, which would be on that in the pie chart on the right there, um, you know, comments from affected Alaska villages. But check this out and, and hit me up if you want more information on this. So with that, I'll close out. I really appreciate you guys uh, listening to this talk and I hope that you check out our group. We're going to have lots more great presentations despite COVID. I'm really looking forward to Oliver's talk in, in October. So follow us on Facebook and Twitter or check out the website to get more updates on our events. Um, like I mentioned, you know, the club is kind of, hasn't had a big reach in the past, but we're hoping to get the word out there more about the club. And we know there's tons of people that are interested in fly fishing, you know, whatever your skill level, if you've been fly fishing since you were tiny, or if you have never even touched a fly rod and you just arrived in Alaska, there's a place for you in this group, it's a really nurturing group, um, great bunch of people. And I think there's going to be great things in the future for it. So keep an eye out for our different events, the, the uh, October Delta Clearwater trip, the meeting. And um, if you're interested in the kids camp or the annual banquet, definitely check out our website for more information on that. Thanks a lot. And uh, give me a, send me a message if you have any other questions.